Her Sports Six Nation Show in association with Opal. Hello and welcome to the final episode of Her Sports Six Nations show brought to you by Opal, the exclusive car partner to the IRFU. You can catch up on this episode and every episode in the series on YouTube and our social channels or listen to the podcast on every podcast app. So last weekend we had the final round of the TikTok Women's Six Nations and obviously for Ireland we succeeded in getting that much needed second home win. What did you make of the game? Yeah, look, I think the final round of games as a whole uh, were brilliant. A couple of close games. Um, obviously, Scotland-Ireland was close. Italy and Wales um, were was a very close game. And England obviously won the Grand Slam against France a little bit comfortably in the end. But Ireland's game was just a great way to finish the tournament for them. You know, they'd had a lot of ups and downs. And to win it in the fashion that they did, you know, last kick of the game... It was brilliant. It was brilliant for the game, brilliant for them and kind of that growth and improvement that they're trying to get and to bring them into a summer tour full of confidence is is really, really great for them. You could see how much it meant to them um, when that final whistle went and, you know, they've been sharing it on social media and everything else because they put so much work into the last, you know, eight to ten weeks and... As I said, there were a lot of ups and downs. So to finish like that must have just felt so, so good for them. And kind of, I suppose, all the, the work they put in finally coming to fruition for them. And I suppose before we get into the match itself, as you said there, it was a great Saturday of rugby and all the games. Do you think everyone in the table finished where they were kind of supposed to? I don't know about supposed to. Like looking... If you had said before the tournament that this was going to be the layout uh, or the, the standings, I would have been a little bit surprised. Um, you know, I wouldn't really have thought that Scotland would finish bottom of the table. Yeah. But looking back on some of their performances, I suppose they didn't do themselves justice over the course of 80 minutes and over the course of the tournament. Um, but they will be very, very disappointed in that and be looking to really make a massive improvement leading into the World Cup. For Ireland, we knew this was going to be a difficult campaign and, um, you know, we were hoping for that third place finish. That really is kind of the aim for a lot of teams that just aren't ready to compete with the likes of England and France just yet. And we fell at the first hurdle against Wales, so we knew that, you know, third place was going to be tricky to get. But to finish the way they did, get fourth, get two home wins, um, it's great for them to be able to bring some momentum now into the summer tour. And um, I'd say you know as the course of the tournament went on you know they'd be happy enough with fourth place but still they know themselves a lot of room to improve but that can only be a good thing so the squad then itself on the day obviously we knew we were going into the match with a lot of injuries we had vicky irwin at full back sam monaghan she returned to the pack there and then nikki cohey was in at 10 as well what did you make of their positions you know, I thought Vicky Irwin did quite a good job of full back, particularly in the early stages. She was tested quite a lot. And, you know, her hands and her positioning uh, back there in uh, open space was pretty good. Probably didn't get to attack the ball as much as she would have liked. And um, we didn't have a lot of possession, particularly in the second half. And um, so I thought it was a pretty solid display from her. And I'm sure she'd be pretty happy with her first cap and hoping to gain a few more. Uh, Sam was obviously a very welcome return after her, her previous displays in, in the championship. She did well, put herself about, a couple of big shifts, you know, line at work was really good. I thought she had a little bit of a quieter game than she normally would have, but still, you know, stood out a little bit and just did her job very, very well. Nikki, um, you know, her first start, I think, since 2018, um, looked a little rusty. She's been flying in the AIL and, and doing really, really well with Railway and, and the way that they play really suits her. But I think she struggled a little bit and probably a lot of that was due to the conditions on the night. It was very slippy, very wet, you know, windy, just horrible conditions. And she didn't look as composed as I, I would normally see her when she's playing. And I think she struggled to kind of take control of the game and get on top of things. Um, She'll know that herself, but like I'd back her to, you know, come back this year um, or next season with Railway and put in some similar performances there. But um, didn't really take the opportunity uh, to cement her, her place at 10 there, in my opinion. And then the first half itself, Scotland obviously got the first try of the game. Do you think that put Ireland kind of a bit on the back foot? They were obviously hoping to get in there first and put 
pressure on Scotland? Yeah, not the ideal start for Ireland, you know. Um, if you look at the stats throughout the campaign, Scotland's line it has been an area where they have been very, very strong and we knew that they'd use that as any opportunity uh, against us. You know, Ireland's mall defence itself hadn't been great, uh, particularly at the start of the campaign. They had improved upon it, but we knew that Scotland would target it and they did and it was very early on they got that try and they put massive pressure on us uh, trying to exit in our own 22, got the turnover penalty, went for the line and, and scored a mall try off that. I will say initially the mall defence from Ireland was excellent, I thought we'd done enough to actually stop uh, the mall from advancing but Scotland just had applied too much pressure and were able to kind of slip off the back of that mall and score a try and it wasn't a great start, you know, not the one Ireland were hoping for but we managed to compose ourselves, you know, march back up the field, dominate a bit of possession and get our scores on the board. And when we got a penalty and a try to be to go in leading a half time, which is a great response because, you know, to go behind early to Scotland and what we knew was going to be a very evenly and tight uh, game. It, it was a little bit worrying to see us being, um, I suppose, dismantled that quickly. But uh, the composure and the resilience to, to fight back and go in ahead at halftime was brilliant. And then Neve Jones obviously got the try there for us. She was a player you kind of, I suppose, were a bit wary of at the start of the campaign. But she's really come on, got the player of the match here in this game. What did you make of her performance? Absolutely. Very much deserved player of the match. I thought she was excellent throughout. And like, yeah, look, I was a bit harsh on her maybe at the the start of the campaign, purely because we had had Kleena Maloney in there for so long and I felt it was a bit a bit of an unusual decision to leave her out of the squad and I knew that Neve Jones was going to have a tough task on her hand and Neve is an excellent player in the loose, you know, we've seen that her physicality, her aggression, her tackling is phenomenal, you know, she gets through a, a serious amount of work but her throwing has been an area of her game that let her down. Um, now, she improved upon that throughout the uh, campaign, which is great to see. But just at the weekend, she was phenomenal. I don't know, was it maybe that she was playing up at home Belfast for uh, the first time ever in Kingspan? But she put on a show and she really scored that try at the end of the first half. But I really wish that she could have got in the end of her block down in the second half. It would have just summed up the night for her. Um, a very much deserved player of um, the match. And... You know, I, I think she's really taken that, that two jersey for her own, you know, and that was up for grabs because of, of Kleena Maloney's absence at the start of the campaign, which she was excellent. And I think she ended up playing the full 80 as well, yeah. which is, you know, quite unusual for a front row player. Mm -hmm. And then obviously Enya Breen's try as well and then her kick at the end. That, like, I suppose it was mounting pressure from the Irish side, but what did you make of her performance, particularly at the end there? I think in general the try just um, was a phenomenal effort by the whole team. We managed to maintain possession uh, for the last probably six or seven minutes. Once or twice Scotland had thwarted us when we thought we were over the line, but you know, we just came back wave after wave of attack and eventually we got over the line and you know, scored by Enya, who I, I really thought had an excellent game in midfield. We did think we might see her move to ten because she took over the reins there when Nicole Cronin went off last week, but she did really well at the centre. She made a lovely break in the first half off a of scrum, uh, slipped off a couple of tackles, just couldn't find an end <coughs> an end uh, product from it. But she backed herself with that try, probably could have gone one pass out uh, for an easier finish, but maybe she was wary that we had to score the conversion um, and she used all her power and strength to score it. And I suppose there was probably a massive wave of relief from myself and the rest of the crowd and the team itself to, to get over the line, particularly because we had come really close in, in the couple of phases before and Scotland had managed to stop us. And I didn't know where we were going to get another chance, but I suppose the desire the work rate, you know, the passion from this team just to, to get it done. And for Enya to score that try and to pick herself back up and have to take that conversion kick was massive because we saw in the first half she missed the conversion uh, from a very similar position uh, with Neve Jones' try. And I didn't know whether she'd be up for taking it or not. We obviously have Hannah O'Connor, who's a, a very able kicker as well. And I saw them having a conversation when the try was scored and you could see Hannah O'Connor pat her on the back and basically tell her, you have this, I believe you. And <clears throat> that's just great to see from the team and like to get that kind of backing from your teammates. I'm sure she was on an absolute high and 
you know, she hit that over, no bother. And, uh, you know, the pictures and the, the scenes afterwards show you how much that meant to them. But I, I really thought Enya was very solid. And as I said, she got that deserved try and the conversion and all the plaudits that come with it. Mm -hmm. I'm sure, like, it's a moment she'll probably never forget, especially playing in front of a home crowd there in Belfast. But obviously there was a lot of positives from the game. But one of the negatives, I suppose, was the penalties. Again, they've kind of consistently had a very high penalty penalty count Ireland what did you think of them especially in the second half there yeah look it's been a theme of this championship uh, for this Irish team that we've just continuously been put under pressure um, and been forced into giving away a couple of penalties each time and the problem is that if they're in in your own half and you're giving away those penalties good teams will hurt you um, and especially teams that have good kickers and we saw that with Scotland um, at the weekend that Helen Nelson, she she didn't have her rhythm really in the first half and, you know, missed her conversion, uh, which would be quite unusual for her. She's a pretty good goal kicker at around 70%, whereas I think Ireland was came into that game with about 25% or 23% or something like that. So I didn't know if she'd have it, but she got into her groove in the second half, knocked over a couple of penalties, and it kind of looked like the game was... Was that just builds reach. up that scoreboard absolutely then, yeah. and like the problem is like they just keep knocking it over and there's pressure then in Ireland's head going well we can't give away a penalty here because they're going to score it and, and go further ahead and what that also does is the more Scotland score like the crowd then dampens and quietens a little bit and the atmosphere leaves and as we saw towards the end of the game when Ireland were pushing for that, that final try it was the crowd that were really getting into it and pushing them on and that, that lifts the players and when the opposite is happening and the other team is getting on top, you know, that can have an effect. But um, it's something I'm sure Greg and the team be looking to change leading into um, the summer series and, and beyond because you, you're just killing yourself and your team when you're giving away these penalties, particularly if they're unforced, if they're not rolling away, if they're high tackles. They are things that can be easily fixed, you know. The ones that are gotten through, you know, the other team makes a really good poach or steal. You can work on getting to the breakdown quicker to stop that, but uh, they're a little harder to judge and they're not as easy uh, to, you know, stop. But high high tackles, offsides, um, all that sort of stuff, that kind of not rolling away, they're easily fixed by hard work and, and just being disciplined. And mm -hmm. that's something that I guarantee will be focused on for this squad in the next few weeks. And then on the day as well, we obviously were missing a lot of key players. Emer Constein was out, Nicole Cronin. Do you think they were missed or will, were they well covered on the day with different players? Well, look, as we've spoken about, there's been a lot of players missing over these last two rounds. But I think a lot of players stepped up into uh, positions where they maybe hadn't got a chance and, and really took an opportunity to... Maybe not stake a starting claim, but just to let Greg know, I'm a good player, I'm here, you know, I'm not just here to make numbers, I want to get a jersey and I want to do well. And, you know, um, obviously you're going to miss players of the calibre of, of Emer Consign, who's one, our most capped player in the squad, uh, Barsene, obviously, who came back in. Um, you know, Nicole at 10, I talked about Nikki a little bit. I think they'll have a good battle there uh, over the next few months and weeks and um, obviously Stacey Flood might come back in and play 10 who knows but the 10 jersey is definitely one that has not been cemented but the problem with the 10 jersey is whoever plays in that position needs time to settle in it's, it's probably the most difficult position on a pitch to fill and you know it's not going to happen overnight that you find the successor or the long-term wear of that jersey it needs a lot of time to do that so I hope we get a bit of continuity in the summer tour at 10 if we have autumn internationals and next year six nations because again we're building for the next world cup so we have plenty of time to give whoever's wearing that 10 jersey the opportunity to grow into that role and become really comfortable there and comfortable at reading defenses and figuring out what's the best plan of attack for Ireland so in that sense we missed someone standing up and really grabbing that 10 jersey as their own but again you know, Nikki still could all, have, all to play for absolutely, suppose, yeah. and like you know, just because Nikki didn't have her best game in green at the weekend doesn't mean that opportunity is gone for her either. We caught up with Emer earlier to find out what she thought of the campaign so far and how she's dealing with her injury. Yeah, so look, the girls were fantastic at the weekend. It was a great win, and um, they really pulled it out of the out of it at the end, and deservedly so. Like were fantastic from you know they were definitely deserving winners of that, and it just showed their heart and their pride at the end of the game to pull it out. It was difficult to watch from the sidelines, especially with Enya kicking over in the 83rd minute. 
So it was a great score from her. Um, the injury is like a 12 week injury. So look, it's not bad timing from looking on the positive side. It's, it's off season and um, it'll give me plenty of time holidays in four weeks to you know rehab it as well so like it could be worse it could have been in January um, and it's not you know I don't require surgery or anything like that so look it's it's the best of bad situation so we'll try and stay stay optimistic but yeah overall campaign I suppose mixed we we disappointed with that first home loss against Wales and um, but then two really good other home performances as well from the girls uh, France and England were always going to be the ones that you know we believed we could win, but it was always going to be our toughest test. And obviously they came out on the upper hand. So fourth place isn't too bad, I suppose, two wins. Um, but look, it's a good it's a good place that we're in a really good place heading into so the summer tour and heading into Six Nations next year. Welcome back. A quick reminder that you're listening to the Her Sport Six Nations show brought to you in association with Opal, the exclusive car partner to the IRFU. So overall, Ireland's campaign, we saw them finish fourth and they got two of the predicted three home wins what do you think of their finish yeah look as I said and um, they would have been expecting three home wins I would have been expecting three home wins and I think a lot of people who know the team would have been expecting that particularly based off of the players we have and past performances and um, we knew after the Wales game that wasn't possible and so I'm sure the aim was okay let's go two home wins and if we can get an upset in another game uh, brilliant if not let's put in performances and um, as I said, I think they'll be very happy with fourth and they pulled it out of the bag. The Italy win was probably the most convincing win of the campaign. You know, I thought they did a really good job and that's kind of what I'm hoping they'll look back on and go, these are what we did really well. How can we make sure that we do that in every game? I'd be looking to the first half of the England game and saying, we put in a brilliant performance in that first half against the best team in the world. Why can't we do this against every team and for 80 minutes? What's stopping us? How do we improve on that? Um, as I said, discipline wasn't great throughout the campaign. So that's another really easy fix for them um, with penalty count and stuff like that. But we saw a lot of really good moments. Like I think Sam Monaghan, Neve Jones been a revelation this tournament. I thought Linda Dugang had a really, really good tournament. Uh, she was excellent at the weekend. You know, we've blooded a lot of new players. A lot of younger players who maybe only came in with one or two caps now have gotten more exposure. And, you know, it, it's been a successful campaign in that regard. Coming into it, we were hoping to obviously get performances and results. But at the end of the day, we were looking at that new squad, that new management. And we were looking to build depth and experience. And I think we've set ourselves on the right path to do that. We have plenty of time till the next World Cup to continue to do that. You know, next year, there'll probably be a little bit more pressure on them in terms of results because, again, they'll be used to the system, they'll be used to the coaching and the playing style that's going on now. But in some ways, the Wales game aside, a successful tournament. And Nicola Friday, her first campaign as captain, how do you think she did? Yeah, you know, I thought she looked a little bit shaky in the first game against Wales and probably wasn't used to that role and that pressure management that was going on maybe wasn't quite used to talking to the ref and trying to figure out what was going on. But I think she really grew into that role and particularly in the England game, she yeah, we've stood seen up. Her step up. Yeah, we yeah, exactly. I, I really think uh, she stepped up asking the ref about certain incidents. Were we going to review things? Why was that try given or why wasn't that try given? What was that penalty for? And that's really reassuring to see. Again, you know, you're given the captaincy. That's a big ask. And one thing we didn't want to happen for, was for it to detract from her game. And thankfully, I don't think it has. Uh, I thought she, again, was great and showed great leadership at the weekend. She won pivotal lineouts right towards the end of the game, which led to our try. And particularly in the lineout has been an area of concern for us. So it was great to see her grow and mature into that role um, over the course of the campaign. And I'm sure she'll only get more comfortable with that as, as uh, time goes on. And... Yeah, like, let's, see, let's see where it goes. And I hope she has enjoyed it and has been able to enjoy the campaign and not focus too much on, on the captaincy and what that meant and, and be able to play her own game. And is there anyone else that you think has kind of cemented their position on the team? We obviously had Neve Jones, Sam Monaghan, Nicola Friday herself, but in the initial games especially, we would have had Stacey Flood in there as well who had some great performances too. Yeah, look, I think there's a lot of players who... Uh, definitely added a lot of credit to their bank and um, I don't know if you can ever say that someone has cemented their position because we do not know what's going to happen over the next couple of weeks and months you know injuries can happen retirements might happen 
um, for whatever reasons, players might might not be included into squads. You know, they might fall out of favour, they might fall out of form. Um, and unfortunately, like, you're only as good as your last game. That has been a saying that's been going along. But there, they, look, there have been players who've been excellent and who I'm sure will be involved um, in the next squad if they're available. For the summer tour to Japan, I think a lot of players put their hand up and... As you said, I think Stacey Flood, Eve Higgins, uh, Sam Monaghan, Linda Jugang, Neve Jones all had really, really good campaigns and, you know, have been a really good core group. Amy Lee, Murphy Crow, the same. But in that summer tour, I actually don't know what player is going to be available to us. The Sevens have a World Cup coming up in September, so I can't quite see them being involved because they're going to be preparing for that. They might be, but I can't quite see it. So there's another opportunity, if they're not involved, for more players to get in and, and be uh, given an opportunity. We might see more of a wider base. Greg mentioned about a couple of under-18 players who he was really impressed with from the under-18 Six Nations. They might be given an opportunity. Um, but, yeah, look, there, there's a group of players. I would say that the majority of that Six Nations squad will be involved in the summer tour. As I said, if the Sevens players aren't involved, there's an opportunity to bring in some more players. But... Um, I, I think overall a lot of players have done a lot of good work there and can only have benefited and added to the their chances of being selected for next squads but but anything can happen and the sevens players as you mentioned there it was obviously the main talking point going into this campaign that we were going to lose them halfway through and we since have the game against Scotland there at the weekend, they obviously had their own tournament and got a bronze medal there. What do you think, what do you make of that, the Sevens players going off, getting their own medals, but at home, like their girls, I suppose, have games to play for the Six Nations too? Like as I said last, um, in the last episode, that the Sevens girls, and I hate saying that because they're Fifteens players too, but those girls who are contracted to the Sevens squad, um, they knew coming into this tournament that there was going to be a clash at the end um, with the Langford Sevens in Canada and the last two rounds of the Six Nations and that potentially some or all of them may not be involved in the end of the Six Nations. I'm sure the whole Six Nations squad, management, all knew that as well and it was discussed, we just weren't privy to that. Mm -hmm. um, again, as I mentioned, that tournament that they were at over in Canada was a senior international tournament. It has... Uh, the exact same bearing and importance and significance as the Six Nations does. It's just that probably the uh, Ireland Sevens does not have as big a following um, and a lot of people wouldn't know as much about them as they would the Six Nations because it's this huge global tournament. What they were able to do in, in Canada was an unbelievable achievement. To get a bronze medal, uh, one of you know, out of the 12 top teams that were there, including the return of New Zealand and Fiji, who have been um, unbelievable teams in that, in that series for so long. To get a bronze medal, their first time ever to get back-to-back -back medals was an incredible feat. And the displays and the performances they put in was fantastic. And then, like, what a weekend for, for women's rugby in Ireland. For the girls at home to be able to show that regardless of who's putting on the green jersey, they're going to put in the uh, best performance they could give 100% to the cause and come out with a win and it was great we're celebrating a win against Scotland um, you know a second home win in the tournament and finishing the campaign in a high and then the next day we were able to celebrate our, our seven team go off and win a bronze medal on the international stage and like it's incredible like they came third behind Australia and New Zealand like you know beating teams and finishing higher than teams like France and USA and Canada and um, Fiji and those those teams all have rich histories of like sevens rugby and, and performing really well and they all went to the Olympics and we didn't and, and we beat them and it was an incredible performance I'm so so proud of the girls and for them to build that experience even though it is sevens it's still at the end of the day rugby I suppose what can they take with them then when they come back and play 15s eventually I think the beauty of rugby outside of it being just a really exciting spectacle to watch while it's really difficult on the players playing, it makes you improve your individual skills. So you need to be an excellent tackler. You need to be an excellent passer, an excellent uh, rucker, clearing out. You know, you need to be really good and strong in your carry and you need to be able to finish and, and defend as a team and as a unit. And like all those individual strengths 
they can only help your game when you go back to 15s and, and vice versa. There's a lot of things in 15s that can help a lot of players and transfer into sevens. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's rugby, it's international rugby. It's at a great standard. Um, and as we see, when those sevens players come into the squad, into the 15 squad, they, they slot in seamlessly and they do a great job. And, you know, I just can't wait to see what, what we have in store, both on the sevens and the 15s front, because you know, things can only get better. Mm -hmm. And then overall, Ireland's campaign, as you said there, we got new caps, two out of the three predicted home wins. Heading into the next Six Nations, what would you like to see change? Do you think, I suppose, they kind of lose a bit of that give we're giving them for, with their new coaches, new players? Would you expect more for them next year? Yeah, I think a lot of people will be expecting a little bit more, um, you know, a bit more complete performances, uh, again, definitely, we'll only have two home games next year, which will be England and France. They'll be very difficult, but they'll still be targeting those three other games to improve upon. Hopefully, we get some contracts in there by then, which starts to make a difference. But I suppose they should be much more comfortable with the system that Greg um, and his staff or his management are, are trying to play. They should be much more... Uh, cohesive with each other because again there were a lot of chopping and changes between certain partnerships this year and, and positional changes so they should just be more cohesive as a whole much more used to playing with each other uh, as I said those younger players and those newer cap players will have a lot more international experience come the next six nations and hopefully we can get those three three away wins next year and actually start to compete a little bit with France and England that would be a really really successful campaign. And then France and England, obviously their game was the big match and England are now the Grand Slam winners for the fourth consecutive title in a row for the Six Nations as well. It's also their 23rd consecutive win. What have you made of their performance this campaign? Oh, they're just an incredible team, an incredible outfit and their strength and depth is phenomenal. Like you look at some of the players that didn't even make their uh, 23 for the weekend's match and... You have some world-class players, obviously the most notable being Abby Dow, who um, is injured and, and probably would have been involved. But like the quality of players that they have that are able to come in and fill a hole, like Sarah Hunter, their captain wasn't able to play and they were able to bring Poppy Cleal off the bench, who was nominated for World Player of the Year uh, last year. So they have just been an incredible outfit. And as much as it pains me to say it, uh, they play some really, really good rugby and they are a really physical and dominant team. I was hoping that France could put it up to them a little bit more at the weekend, but England just showed their class. And the big thing about them is that if you they force you into an error, into a mistake, and then they capitalise on that and they punish you. And France had a very costly uh, end of the first half, which England capitalised upon, and, and France just could not get back into the game. And England just finished out the game, um, ensuring that France couldn't kind of get close enough to them to really cause them any problems. And... Uh, maybe not the quite the exciting finish as people had hoped in terms of a really close game, but England were worthy winners and they're just an unbelievable team and they're absolutely favourites to win the World Cup this year and I don't think anybody can catch them, to be honest. And I think, I suppose it's when they win, if they win that World Cup is when people can say, you know, they're one of the best women's teams in the world, the best women's team in the world. But the stats, I think, are incredible for England there. They trail for just eight minutes across the entire campaign. They got 45 tries. And of course, as you said, they're only France stayed within 50 points of them. So I think it just goes to show like their class. And would you hope, as you mentioned there, that maybe given the next six nations with contracts for not just Ireland, but you know Italy coming into play, that people maybe will get in that 50 point gap there. Yeah, look, obviously I hope that that gap doesn't widen anymore. And um, maybe a positive that we can take from there is that with the World Cup this year, I think we'll see a lot of players from all teams, bar Ireland, retiring. So I'd say we have a lot of players in Scotland, uh, Wales, Italy, France and England who are waiting to get to this world cup and then ret wanting to hopefully retire on a high like again now i'm just like taking opinion here but like someone like you know marley packer who's been around a very long time still playing at an elite level sarah hunter the same you know they maybe even emily scarish like they've been playing for a very very long time and given so much to the cause that i could see them retiring after the world cup if if they went on to win it and you know, while they have great strength and depth coming through, and I'm sure they players to fill that, 
that might actually uh, lessen the gap a little bit come next Six Nations uh, if they were to lose a couple of players of the calibre of those. And you mentioned there, obviously, Marley Packer, and she's one of the four players of the championship up for that title. We also have Sarah Byrne from England, France, Fall from France, and Santos from France as well. Who would be your choice there? It's a really difficult one, to be honest. I think the four of them have been absolutely incredible. Um, Marley Packer has to be the most annoying player in the world because... She just does her job so well. She is a typical seven that is just a menace at the breakdown. Huge tackler, huge uh, ball carrier, scores tries for you, loves what she does and just gets in your face. And as someone who used to play 10 is just someone you do not want to line up against. I think she's been absolutely incredible. I wouldn't be surprised if she got it. But then again, you look at the calibre of other players. Medusa Fall, there's been a huge breakout campaign for her. She's been a huge She's leader for France. She's been the top tackler of the tournament. And even sport. like in the, in the game, the weekend against England, she had a brilliant first half and she's still so young and she only has, I think, 14 caps for France. So there's so much more to come from her. But um, I, I do think Marley Packer will, will get it. Sansous has been incredible for France. Missed the start of... The, or she, she didn't even start the, the campaign. Um, she came off the bench and she's still nominated. But it's been incredible. Sarah Byrne, we've never seen a prop like her. And again, she's still only 24, 25. So much more to come from her. I've never seen a prop as mobile, as strong, as fast. You know, you could put her on the wing and she'd probably do a good job. But... Uh, it's a tricky one to call. I think Marley Packer might just shade it, but I think it's a public vote, so you never know how they're going to go, to be honest. But, might uh, be a popularity. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I, I do think Marley Packer's been incredible, as much as it pains me to give it to her. And if you had to then pick a player of the championship for Ireland, who would you give it to? Um, I, I don't know who I would give it to out and out. Sam Monaghan comes to mind straight away, but I don't also want to forget about Eve Higgins, who was incredible in the three games that she did play. Um, you know, if I was to give it to best young player, I'd probably give it to Neve Jones. Um, and then Sam Monaghan for the, the breakout kind of season that she had for us. You know, we knew exactly what Eve Higgins could do and what she was going to bring to the table. And she did just that. And she performed again with the sevens. But Sam Monaghan, for her being so new to international rugby, her first Six Nations campaign, you know, the performances, the highlight reels that she was she was putting in, I'd, I'd give it to her. I think she, she was excellent. But, um, yeah, the, the three of them are definitely up there for me. And then in terms of your team at the weekend, so obviously the fantasy rugby we've been playing it each week. And then last weekend was round five, the final round of the Six Nations. How did your team get on? I got pipped at the post, I think. Uh, I think I ended up coming second. Um, and not, not, not to make excuses... But I forgot to change my team until I was midway through watching the Italy game. And so there was a few changes I couldn't make, but I was soundly beaten into second, unfortunately. But uh, I'll take it. I'll and take on it. your England and France team there, who did you have that performed well for you? Uh, I had Sansus, I had Fall, I had Packer, uh, I had Scarrett, and I had Sarah Byrne. Uh, Sarah Byrne, I should have made captain. I had Jess Breach as well. Uh, but I should have made Sarah Byrne captain. That was my downfall this, year, this weekend. And for the Ireland and Scotland game, who were your Irish players in there? I had Sam Monaghan. I had Hannah O'Connor and Dorothy Wall. And then for Scotland, I had Helen Nelson at 10. And um, I think Ron Lloyd on the wing. So a second place finish for Hannah on the Fantasy Rugby League table. And earlier, Hannah caught up with Will Connors and Emer Constein to discuss their start to rugby, representing Ireland at 7s and 15s and their first cap songs. My mum wanted me to do uh, ballet. ballet. Yeah. <laughs> Stop. My mum wanted me to do ballet. I, only, I actually said yeah. that just yeah. out of pure yeah. joke. Yeah. Yeah. She My actually wanted you to do ballet? Yeah, she wanted me to do ballet. Uh, but the thing was, I was... In school, there was a, there was an, you got a medal whenever you'd go home uh, if you fell on the yard for the day. So I was coming home every day with this bloody medal. My parents were like, what's going on? What's this medal that keeps winning? So the teacher pulled my parents aside on a parent teacher meeting and was like, look, Will's going home crying every day. Um, and it's <laughs> like, do you know, maybe we should get him into sports or something. And uh, my dad was like, because I wasn't playing football, I was like, we'll get him into rugby first and we'll kind of throw him in there. So I don't know. I don't know. Was it kind of a winning mentality that I just wanted to always go home and medal or I was just a soft underbelly. Emer, 
I suppose we'll start with you. Uh, we're in the middle of Six Nations campaign. You know, it's not been the perfect start, but how was the build-up? We're in a new coach, a new era that everybody's talking about. How has that been for you and what has that felt like for the squad? It was really exciting this year, the fact there was such an emphasis put on the AIL ahead of the Six Nations campaign. So it meant that we got more game time than ever before with our clubs. And so from that, he selected the squad for the Six Nations. So it was good coming into Six Nations, having so much game time under our belts as a squad. Um, obviously, the preparation was, you know, we only had three or four camps, so it wasn't a lot, but we had a lot of game time under our belt. Um, completely new style of play, completely new vibes, totally changed. And look, that's, I suppose, needed as well. Um, if you keep doing the same things, you're going to get the same results. I mean, I suppose a change was needed. And yeah, a lot of vibrancy, a lot of new players, a lot of old players still there. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, look, the results haven't been there but we've seen glimpses we were just chatting about how like it is exciting when we do get the ball and if we can just do more of that in the next few games. Yeah and speak to me about some of those new players coming in like you know they're going to be having a lot of information thrown at them a little bit overwhelmed like how do you as a more experienced player kind of guide them in camp and kind of help them down the right path? I suppose just because we haven't seen them on the big stage doesn't mean that they haven't been playing and I suppose the good thing about these girls is that they're playing way longer than I'm playing rugby because they have been so lucky to grow up through an underage system. You have the likes of Avian coming through who's played more rugby games probably in her life than I have and um, Aoife Wafer is another example. You know they're so talented and they have oodles and oodles of talent coming through and um, it's just great that they now get to put that on the big stage finally. And it is like well, it's great to see, obviously, in, you know, with men's rugby, a lot of them have been playing from underage, but in women's rugby, that historically hasn't been the case. And to see the likes of Aoife Wafer and them come through and Avian Riley has been brilliant. But we've had three games in Six Nations so far, some unbelievable pieces of skill. But who's impressed you uh, from the Ireland team? Uh, we are just talking before about Eva. I think she's... She's really taken this uh, Six Nations in her stride. I love how like she kind of takes on the line. She's got that bit of bit about her, and like it was like you see her going over for the try over the weekend. She's got a smile on her face, and you know I've seen her kind of through like the seven system and everything, and like she's just come onto the world stage and she's just hit the ground run. So it's great to see. Well. Are you a silky back row or a forward player like someone like Sam Monaghan? I think she was given the, yeah. the nickname Sammy Bill Williams, I think, after, after I, her off in, in the Wales game. Can you I, do that? No, I wish I could do that. <laughs> it's just, it's such a, I think you kind of, you, you just have that, like, I think it's really hard to coach into a player. Um, and it's just, like you said, to have that in your team, it's just that bit of X factor, like, that's, going forward that's going to be like the difference in a game and like it's great to have a player of that caliber in the squad how old were you when you actually started playing rugby I w i'd say i'd say it was five or six so it was actually a funny story my uh, my mum wanted me to do uh, ballet, ballet. <laughs> yeah. Stop. My mum wanted me to do ballet. I only, I actually said yeah. that just yeah. out of pure yeah. joke. Yeah. Yeah. She My actually wanted you to do ballet. Yeah, she wanted me to do ballet. Uh, but the thing was, I was in school. There was a, there was an, you got a medal whenever you'd go home uh, if you fell on the yard for the day. So I was coming home every day with this bloody medal. My parents were like, "What's going on? What's this medal that keeps winning?" So. The teacher pulled my parents aside on a parent teacher meeting and was like, look, Will's going home crying every day. Um, and it's <laughs> like, do you know, maybe we should get him into sports or something. And uh, my dad was like, because I wasn't playing football, I was like, we'll get him into rugby first and we'll kind of throw him in there. So I don't know. I don't know. Was it kind of a winning mentality that I just wanted to always go home and medal or I was just a soft underbelly. So your, your mom wanted you to get into ballet. Ballet. You were falling down every day at train, or in school, so you didn't really have that poison grace. Yeah. And so your dad said, here's an idea. Yeah. We'll throw you throw into, rugby. into rugby. Yeah. Well, not a bad uh, but idea. But then if back. I had the old nimble feet from the ballet, I could have been able to <laughs> stay on my feet. So look. You might give us a few a few twirls there yeah, later when we see if you're up to the task. <laughs> yeah, there was definitely no ballet in my story. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. um, completely different. I started rugby when I was 23. And so it came from, I suppose, a long career of Gaelic football and Camogie playing for Clare. Moved up to Dublin and got a call, I suppose, around the time they were trying to scout people, players like yourself, I suppose, to come play rugby who had come from other backgrounds just to make, uh, make a chance and try and qualify for that 2016 Olympics. Um, the player pool was really small at the time so came through that way and was kind of taught every individual skill in isolation with four or five of us in a small group and 
Um, I suppose you'll, you won't forget either that trip we had to San Diego where it was my very first rugby trip. I'd never tackled anyone. Um, <laughs> Stacey Blood and myself were on the bed in that hotel and Thrown she was like, this is, how you, this is how you tackle. Like, I don't, I'd only done yeah. tackle pads, done things in isolation, but never actually played a full contact game. And we went up against the USA, Canada. Like, I actually would cringe when I looked back at the footage of those yeah. games. But look, thrown in the deep end, you the sinker, you swim. Um, I definitely sank that day, but I'm still here anyway. But it, it was, yeah, I suppose unorthodox the way I started playing rugby. And when you chat to, like, I actually was chatting to Aoife away for the other day, and she calculated that she's actually playing rugby longer than I am, even though she's only 18 yeah, or 19, yeah. whereas I'm 30 and have all these years in my belts, but she's still playing longer than me. So I suppose the next generation of girls are coming up and they're getting to play rugby for, for, from the ground up like you did. But um, yeah, unorthodox. Played a bit of sevens for about a year and a half, two years, and then went into 15s. Again, hadn't an idea of 15s, hadn't played that game. Had played more games with Munster than I had at my club, and then went into an Irish squad in the World Cup year, thankfully, and had that really great experience playing in the World Cup. It's mad even just to hear yeah. the, the differences. Like, you started at five or six, yeah, and yeah. you didn't start till 23. Like, yeah. How would you feel if you were told at 23 you're going to pick up rugby for uh, the first time? Like, it's so impressive, though. But, like, you know, like you said, to learn all those skills just from from scratch and like it'd be great to now see the clips from oh uh, from over <laughs> the American <laughs> compared to see we can pull one up on huddle somewhere. <laughs> but like you've had such a great career and stuff like and that's the thing it's uh, to have picked it up from at such a late stage like it's just it's, it's incredible really. and I still think that like coaches probably take for granted that we know things when you're like no I I'm 25 caps for my country but I haven't even played 25 games for my club. Yeah. My story is very, very similar to yours in that I didn't start playing rugby until I was 23. And I went into the sevens program and from there got capped with 15s. But I actually started a 15s international game with Ireland before I started a club game with Old Belvedere senior uh, first team game. Like, and it's absolutely yeah, incredible yeah. to think of that. Like, that would never happen in the men's game. And Baven no. would have been similar when she was yeah. 16. You know, she wasn't... I, I think the she laws, had to get special permission to, to was, get her... She wasn't allowed to play for Connacht because that was a senior competition, yeah, but yet yeah, yeah. she was allowed to play international. So she played club underage yeah. and had to make the jump up and, and play. She wasn't allowed to play senior club even at the time. No. She was playing yeah. at an, at an underage club. So it's just... I suppose the next generation are just so lucky. That that's they're getting an, to do yeah. that. That's the exciting thing, I think, when you look at, like, you look down in Cork and stuff, the amount of young girls there, and, like, they're going to be taking up the game, and, like, to have that much exposure to it, like you said, for you to only have picked it up at such a late point and still have gone on to have such a great career, like, some of these girls coming through who will have so much experience under their belt from an underage system is yeah. it's incredibly exciting. <laughs> Obviously, it was during COVID, so there was no um, there was no fans or anything, which was that was disappointing. But to be honest, uh, when you're doing your first cap, you don't even that's all just on the side. Uh, I remember going out for the anthems, and it was only really then when it kind of hit home that I was playing for Ireland. I was like, oh my god, um, like singing an hour on the vein, like the nerves, everything. I was like, it's like this. Were is you just as nervous, even though like there was no crowd? Because uh, sometimes you forget that you're on live TV yeah. then yeah, when there's I'm, no crowd. I was sick to sick to the belly. I was like, <laughs> oh my god, I just need this to start. Um, but it only really hit there, like between the anthems and then. It's only really when those nerves hit me. I was like, oh my god, what am I doing here? <laughs> but uh, oh, I was such crack, and then like even after just going in, um, going in singing away. What, what was your song? Uh, what did I sing again? Come on, one of the biggest moments of your career and you can't remember what your first cap no, song just, was. I've just absolutely blown on the name of it. I think you, well, give us a tune. No, I've blown on the tune <laughs> of it. I'm like, oh my God. I'm Eva, absolutely what was yours? Froze. I did the music man. Do you know, it's like a sing, -a sing along one where you're like, uh, yeah. I am the music man. Uh, yeah, and then you song, just keep going with yeah. it. Aoife's song in front of all the girls, like out yeah. on the pitch is like, I actually so really cool. like that. Yeah, because yeah, normally, like I actually f didn't get my first cap till later on that evening. We yeah. I played Italy uh, away, and there was five or six of us. Sene um, Italy away which year? Twenty fifteen, oh, yeah. the year we won the Six Nations. Um, 
I sang the cup song actually because Pitch Perfect was out um, so I sang that uh, Grace is what I sang I know every word of it and I couldn't think of Grace or the phrase so when you were like the tune I was like what is the tune? What did you do? Oh, Grace. Grace. Yeah. Oh. That was, that's my go-to. I always that's think. That's a nice yeah. yeah. one. Do you have a go-to? Like, if you do you have a karaoke no, song? No, I don't. And I was just thinking that I need to get something like that. Just, yeah. just to kind of... Yeah, I, never, I don't know the words to anything. I know, like... Really? A verse, maybe. Yeah, and that's yeah, it, yeah, of yeah, things. Yeah. Yeah. Lovely Rosa Claire. You know, Shirley. Shirley. Yeah. yeah. I do know that one, actually. Sure in but no one else knows that. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But nobody so can that, join in. Nobody and the can idea join of in. a first cap song is that you sing a line yeah, yeah. and that everyone else joins in. I have, I so. do think that it is a tricky one. People always have a song they'd love to sing, yeah. but they're really afraid that nobody will join in and yeah. then they're left looking like a tool. I'm, but. I'm surprised Perry in the USA, everybody knew it. Yeah. Yeah, but there's a lot of I, younger kids in there. Yeah, like, I, if I just saw a party in the USA, <laughs> and whatever, and that'd be me done, and then everyone would be singing away. Yeah, I <laughs> know, oh, we're, we're pretty, we're, we're loving a bit of, um, not 90s, not 90s, but it's definitely naughty. Yeah, no, it's, it's, yeah. it's not yeah. newer, recent no. pop and stuff like that, but um, even just looking at um, Sevens Rugby, we all went through the uh, international sevens pathway in the men's game we're seeing the fruits of it like yourself hugo keenan shane daly down in munster robert balakoon is doing phenomenal work up in ulster like how was sevens like for your career how did that help you develop as a player yeah i i had a bit of a weird patch with the sevens because i'm obviously not quick and stuff like Hugo and Jimmy so I, I think in, initially it, I, I didn't take too well to it I was only able to kind of really go up for high balls and stuff off <laughs> kickoffs and then I'd stand on the edge and probably miss around 10 tackles so <laughs> confidence was knocked right down but like once I kind of got into it it was uh, it's just such a free-flowing game and I remember I was told that like in seven minutes in a, in a half you would the amount of exposures you get to things like poaching, you know, tackling, all these different things that in a game of 15s, you don't get that kind of exposure as often. So like as a way to kind of progress all these kind of skills, I thought it was great for that. Um, and it was enjoyable. I had some great trips um, out of it and the lads were great crack. And now, and you know what? At the time I was kind of in, in Leinster, I was in the academy, wasn't really good playing like you're kind of holding pads and stuff and to go off on these seven tours and it just sparks the love of the game again you really enjoy it it's all the crack with the lads and it's just it was a great great experience yeah like there's been so many amazing trips isn't there and um, i suppose my first world series was in dubai and that dubai sevens is such a carnival atmosphere it's just it made me it opened up my eyes to like how fun rugby can be and i suppose it's the festival that is sevens rugby and um, sydney was pretty cool to get over there and um, all over, yeah, like I'm all over the world. Like I, where did, yeah. where, where would you say your, where, where's rugby taking you that you've been like? Well, I'd, ne I'd, yeah, I'd never been to America, so I got over there through sevens, um, and then we went to South America as well. So we got Chile, Uruguay, and then Hong Kong as well. So, but I Hong Kong say, is yeah. Hong Kong is a special tournament though in sevens. Dubai is pretty similar in that it's a a huge kind of festival. It's not just about the rugby. They've so much going on, but like. It's definitely a party atmosphere and one I try to encourage other people to go I back to. I 100% would love to get a group and go over, just even for the Invitational Sevens, just to, or even just to watch, just because there is so much, there's obviously the main pitch, but then going on behind the scenes are all, everyone else playing rugby for fun, um, of all, I suppose, ages and sizes and everyone, and different categories with the elite and with whatever, the lads that are just over there for the crack. But I'd love to go back over to yeah. Dubai, even just to watch, just to, to experience yeah, it again. I, I think for, Festival terms, Dubai Sevens is the best kind of atmosphere for it um, in terms of location and everything else. It's just all encompassing. I think we should do maybe a media gig out to I, Dubai. I, what maybe? do you think? Yeah, can we get a song <laughs> out? I think so. I think it's a great one. Yeah. Thank you for tuning in for the final episode of the Her Sport Six Nations show brought to you by Opal, the exclusive car partner to the IRFU. You can catch up on this episode and every episode of the championship on YouTube or every podcast app. Thank you also to Hannah Tyrrell for joining me here in studio and keep involved in the conversation with us on our social channels, podcasts and YouTube. We'll see you again soon. Her Sports Six Nations show in association with Opal.